My next guest represents Virginia's first district in Congress and is the chair of the Tactical Air and Land Forces Subcommittee, which is part of the House Armed Services Committee. Please welcome Congressman Rob Whitman. Thank you for joining us, Congressman. Well, good afternoon. Great to be with you. Well, you know, it's budget season. Uh, a lot of talk about the budget and with divided government now. President Biden has proposed a budget. Uh, can you talk about your thoughts on it, specifically as it, as it relates to the defense and air power? Absolutely. Well, listen, I think it falls far short of what we need to do to make sure we're countering China. We've seen in the president's budget a proposed 3.2 percent increase. We know the rate of inflation is 6 percent. So we know it falls short in just keeping up with what we did last year. We see the Chinese advertising that they're increasing their budget by 7 percent. And we know that they're not transparent about how much they spend. We know that it's much, much more than that. So we're even falling behind in what the Chinese are saying that they are spending. And we see uh, the real life exposition of what they're doing in building ships and new aircraft. Those things are pretty startling and sobering for the nation. So if we look to in relation to other areas of the budget that are being increased, we see non-defense discretionary spending increasing at a 7 percent rate versus 3.2 percent for defense discretionary. So again, imbalance is there. If you look at what's happening across the spectrum, whether it's ships, but more specifically aircraft, uh, we see we're still on the path for this divest to invest strategy. Listen, it's good that we're building 85 F-35s. I think that keeps us on track. I should say 83 uh, F-35s. It, it keeps us somewhat on track. Uh, there's 24 F-15 EXs in the budget this year, uh, but it's going to leave us far short of the number of aircraft that the Air Force says that they need in order to uh, perform the mission. So all of those elements, I think, are are challenging. We see, too, that there are no F-18s in this year's budget. Uh, the Navy still hasn't executed the 20 that were authorized and appropriated in the 21 budget. There's still a, an agreement pending between Boeing and the Navy on getting those aircraft built. The good news, though, is, is we are on track with B-21. B-21 is shown to be a successful program. Deep penetrating strike bomber is what we need. This aircraft is performing. It's staying on time and on budget. That's a good news story within this. Continued funding exists within the budget for that. So I think in those air platform areas, we're in a, in a, in a good place. The challenge, though, is on the tactical aircraft side, we are still retiring many more aircraft than what we're building. And listen, I'm not a mathematician, but it's hard for me to see how we do addition by subtraction. It's hard for me to see what we are doing in relation to the capacity that the Chinese are building with their J-20 aircraft. Also what they're doing in next generation aircraft. I want to make sure too we're staying on track with our next generation air defense systems, better known as NGAD, and also the unmanned component about that. We need not only that, but we need to make sure that we have a full set of sensors from space to Earth to make sure we have a sensor suite that can withstand what we know the Chinese will do to try to take away information from us. And the information is going to be the key in the battle space. So I think that those things are, are incredibly important. So. What do you think is going to be, you know, there are some, certainly Democrats and, and, and some Republicans, very skeptical of the Pentagon's budget. Uh, they want reductions. However, there are a lot of Republicans and a fair amount of Democrats uh, who do want to boost uh, defense funding. Now that the House is in Republican hands, you mentioned inflation at 6 percent, uh, which is a decent point. Where do you think that that number is going to be? I know it's going to be a you know, roller coaster and you have a lot of cooks in the kitchen. But, sure. but what do you think the number should be? Well, listen, I think it needs to be uh, at least comparable to the rate of inflation. So we're well short of that with the president's budget. I think that has to be a starting point. And there are a number of things that I think have to be addressed in the budget. You know, we talk about the, you know, we talk about aircraft. We talk about F-35s. We talk about uh, F F-18s. We talk about uh, the other elements of, of air power, F-15 EXs. You know, one element that's very concerning is not just the slower growth of those aircraft, but retiring advanced aircraft. The uh, Air Force wants to retire F-22s, the most advanced air-to-air uh, -air combat jet in the world. It just doesn't make sense to me that they want to retire, you know, 20 plus of those aircraft. So those are things, too, that are on the radar screen. And, and so it's not just about, you know, what are we doing to keep up with inflation, but it's what do we do, too, 
to get to those areas that we know are now going to be uh, extracted from the president's budget and that we're going to have to be able to put in. Remember, if you put those things back in, you have to find some other place to be able to get those dollars. So uh, I think that we're going to have to be there. I think folks understand the true challenge that we had from China, the urgency that we have to act in order to counteract China. And remember, this whole idea of divest to invest, where we say, well, we're going to divest in legacy platforms and somewhere out in the future, beyond the fight up, the five-year defense plan, we're going to fund new platforms to replace those. We don't have the time to do that. The threat is now. And I think by any measure, we know the threat is right at our doorstep. So the question is, is how do we make sure we have that capacity? Listen, I am not in any way, shape or form opposed to retiring legacy platforms. But you can't retire them and then the plan be, well, we're going to wait outside the fight up uh, five years and then we'll build something new. The Chinese are not going to wait around. And in the meantime, you know, they're going to be building capacity and capability that far exceeds what we have. So that's the urgency that has to be reflected in this year's defense uh, appropriations as well as our authorization. You know, uh, uh, since uh, the election, I've interviewed a number of ranking members, whether that be at the subcommittee level. Uh, who are now chairman or committee chair, and uh, obviously very frustrated last year. They, they, a lot of them, uh, Republicans, have said that they were not getting the level of communication or response to letters, uh, whether it's retiring aircraft or other issues. Has the level of communication from the Biden administration improved since the House flipped? Well, it, only marginally. I would say that we still aren't getting the depth of information that we need to make proper decisions. And remember, the best way that we can perform our job is to make sure we have in-depth information. And that's critically important. And many times what we're having to do is we're having to step outside the realm of the Pentagon to be able to get that information, to, to gather those, those data points from others out there that are, that are part of this, this effort, uh, both in the in the hardware and software realm, but also those folks that deal with this each and every day, that shouldn't be the way, uh, the way it goes uh, about because we know that decisions are being made within the Pentagon. It's incredi incredibly important for us to understand how are those decisions being made and what's the information that they are using to make those decisions. It's fine for us to get information from other sources, but to truly inform ourselves about how the Pentagon is making decisions. We need to be informed about the information that they are using to do that. And if they want us in any way, shape or form to understand a decision, ones that we may disagree with, then it's incumbent upon them to give us that information, the information that they use for decision making. If they don't, then it creates on our side either uh, assumptions that we have to make without that information or uh, filling in the blanks, which I think is not the way we feel best in understanding what the Pentagon is doing. But in many situations, that what, that's what we're relegated to because we don't have the full scope of information when we ask for it from the Pentagon. Congressman, do you think that Congress has been briefed adequately on two remarkable recent events, uh, the Chinese spy balloon that was shot down, as well as uh, uh, the Air Force drone that was shot down by or, or clipped by the Russians? Have you gotten a, enough information, or, or do you think the administration should be sharing more with both Congress and the American public? Right. Well, listen, we've gotten basic information. All of it's classified. We've gotten basic information about what was recovered. Uh, where is it as we speak? What are they doing to analyze what was on that platform? What are they missing uh, of what they saw when the platform was, was in the air? But all of those things are classified. So I would say we've gotten the very baseline information. But the details, the details of what was that platform able to do? What do we think it did? What do we believe, too, that it discovered as it flew over that wasn't related to gathering things like signal intelligence or taking photographs or those things that are normal parts of intelligence gathering? One of the things that I think is very disturbing about this is I think the Chinese were purposefully sending this platform over the United States to see what our reaction was. Because remember, we heard the Pentagon say, oh, don't worry about it. You know, we're, we're hiding things, we're moving things around, we're closing things down. Well, this platform sensed every bit of that. So if you were in the Chinese shoes and you were saying, what are the vulnerabilities? How do we exploit what we see the United States do in reaction to this flying over? You would want to know that so that you could counter what the United States is doing. To me, that was the most troubling element of what happened with this. I want to hear, too, 
what we believe the Chinese were able to gather, not just in what the platform was able to 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 absorb as far as uh, transmissions of communications and those sorts of things, but what do we think they were able to gather in observing what we did in reaction to this platform? I was watching the debate uh, on the House floor with the creation of the new uh, Committee on China, and I was struck how bipartisan it was. And then I watched the first hearing, uh, which was at night, and I was struck by how bipartisan. Now, I know both sides of the aisle like to bash China, but mm -hmm. what's the opportunity here of bipartisanship, and you don't hear a lot of this, on a, on a major issue in the House, and how does that relate to our ability to keep uh, modernizing the Pentagon so we can compete with China and others? Well, listen, I think it's a great opportunity. I agree with you. It is, it is incredibly bipartisan. It's on par with the House Armed Services Committee, which, which has been incredibly bipartisan. So it's a real honor for me to serve in leadership positions there on the Armed Services Committee, but also as a senior member on the Select Committee on the Co Chinese Communist Party. It's a great opportunity for us. The Select Committee can gather information, can also draft legislation. It can't pass legislation, but it can be the subject matter expert on what needs to be done in order to counter China. And I really believe what we need to look at is what are the most important strategic places that we can be in isolating China? How do we make sure that we don't allow them to get a stronger foothold to displace the United States or in other ways to be transactional in, a, in, an, in an exploitive way with other nations around the world. And that's exactly what China is doing now. So I think there's a, a lot of opportunity there for us to put forth our policies and how we deal with that and also to use this to go to our friends and allies and say, join us. Join us in combating what China is doing around the world, which is a threat to, mm -hmm. I think, nations around the globe and, and look at what China does in a very transactional way. They are exploited with other countries. We just went through today with the AFRICOM commander, General Langley, about what's happening in Africa with China and what they're doing to exploit those African countries. We see the same thing now happening in Central America. So there's great opportunities for us to affect foreign policy, to affect national security policy, and for that matter, to affect homeland security policy, because many of the things that are going on are happening right within our own borders, whether it's Chinese sourced fentanyl coming across the border, Confucius Institutes, what they're doing to recruit intellectual talent from places like Los Alamos. All of those things collectively show that China is, is very focused on using every mechanism possible. We're used to the aspect of the Cold War, where things were really on a military level, because Russia didn't have an economic relationship with us. China has such intricate economic relationships in the United States that they know that they can hold us at risk economically, strategically, and even for that matter, they see with elements of, of our social fabric here. You saw today the hearing on TikTok. I mean, that's another yep. element for them to infiltrate and gather data to use that against us. So at every turn, the Chinese are not just limiting themselves to the kinetic realm, to the military realm, to the strategic realm. They are looking at every way to weaken the United States. Uh, last question. You know, spending is a big issue this year with House Republicans trying to clamp down on spending. You've got to pass a budget resolution, though. That's the first step before yes. you can pass individual appropriations bills. You know you're not going to get any help on that budget resolution. It's a slim majority in the House. Are you confident that House Republicans will be able to pass a budget this spring? I, I am. Listen, there's been a lot of great conversations about what needs to be in there. I think people realize, too, that you know, with a very slim majority, none of us are going to get everything that we want. In a perfect world, you'd say, I want to get 100 percent of what I think needs to happen in the fiscal realm to manage this nation's finances. Realistically, we're not going to do that. What we need to do is to find the bill that aligns itself with the largest number of members, and that has to be over 218. I think that we can do that. I think people understand that if we don't do that, if we don't have the ability to put our plan forward and have it that gathers 218 votes, it's going to be very difficult for us to negotiate on anything with the Senate or the president. So that's the starting point. And I feel very good about what's happening in these listening sessions to take all this information and put together something that can get 218 votes. And I think we have to do that sooner than later. I think the sooner that we put that out there, the sooner that we have that debate, the sooner that we get it passed out of the House, the more room that we will have in negotiating a, a, a deal that I think would be uh, acceptable to the majority of folks on our side of the aisle. I, actually, I, it has to, I believe it has to get, get to 218. But the way we do that is to make sure we get 
our our budget framework passed out and the things that we need to use to negotiate as we go forward with the debt ceiling debate. Yes, it will be a, it will be a, a tight vote uh, for that budget resolution. They usually are with small majorities. Congressman, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.